Um, I guess for us, the CBD school at Lake Botanic High really enabled us to think about education differently. We wouldn't design an airport, you know, the same as you would 50 years ago or any of those sorts of things, roads and, and hospitals. So we don't certainly look at designing schools in the same way. We know so much more about learning. Um, the schools that were built in the 60s and 70s and earlier served the purpose of the industrial era, which was what we needed. But now, as you've all heard today, our kids need to be different. Um, the explicit teaching is still critical. Don't get me wrong there. We need to have educators working alongside kids um, in an explicit teaching model. But if you did that all day, you wouldn't get what we needed to move forward. So I'll just share our journey with you. Just a bit of background, those of you um, who may or may not know about the project, it is going to be opened in 2019. It was originally announced by a Premier in 2013, that's due to the demographic shift. Um, those people who know Adelaide High, it's a really popular school, but as the infill has happened, the demographics have changed in terms of high-rise living. Um, that school doesn't have enough spaces or places, so it became clear to government that we needed to build a school. The location of that school has been one of great interest. Um, those who originally remember the announcement, it was going to be um, at the, the old RAS site. Um, but when we looked further at that and what that would mean for our kids living in a, maybe a, a, an area that's been um, needing to be rebuilt um, and that sort of program happening, what else was around? And we found that with UniSA had an opportunity to look further afield. And that's where we are now, next door to the zoo, refurbishing the reed building. Um, it's going to be for 12.50 students, it will be years 8 to 9 and it will also only start with 8s and 9s originally as mentioned because it's going to be really helpful to us in terms of growing the culture and what we need to do there. It's in an amazing location um, and we'll talk more about that because our partners have just been fantastic. Both universities, the Parklands, Botanic Gardens and Zoo have just been really on the journey with us the whole time and that's another story in itself. There's so many snippets of critical collaboration, collaboration, working in teams and groups. But to share it all today is hard, but I'll try and bring in bits of that as I go. The announcement was a STEM school with science and health focus, which is really, again, an area where our nation and worldwide is heading. But it is a school for all. So if you're a student, you can get all areas of the curriculum there, and the design of that is really um, came, came very important to us. For example, when we did the feasibility study, we noticed that there wasn't enough kind of small intimate performing arts area in that places in gyms. So you'll find those school things in our vertical school. They're still there so those students can have access to that. Um, those who know the Foam Street and the rebuilding, this is our dream. This is what we're designing. So the old building's on the left and then down the bottom you'll see our new building. The left-hand side of the new building is the old reed building transformed with an active atrium in the middle and the new build on the side. If you've been down Frome Street, you'll know to set uh, activity is happening um, and you should see a crane there in the next week or so as well. So building is happening and we're progressing on. Um, drivers for the change, like I've already mentioned, housing um, densification, demographic changes. We're moving towards um, a 24-hour city, whether we like it or not, that's happening. We can see the difference in the way trade's happening, obviously IT access and so on and so forth. So there's been a great change in terms of urban living. I won't stay too long on this particular slide because we've heard this all morning. We owe it to our students to ensure that they have these skills and aptitudes to move them forward as they go into their career pathways and into their lives. Without these kind of aptitudes and thinking, then we won't have the, I guess, the social needs that we have moving forward. Um, we still need, like I mentioned, the explicit teaching, but we can't just rest on that. We need all these other things too. So designing a school to enable that to happen was just such a great opportunity to do. When we design spaces and places, whether it's the um, Adelaide Botanic High or other, other areas of uh, learning opportunities, we ask ourselves a number of questions. What sort of education do we want to see in the future? What sorts of learning relationships do we want to foster? What competencies do we want to learn? And what tools, resources, support are available to us to assist learning? If you think about your own teams back at your work, workplace, what's different about those questions? Not a lot. When you're looking at setting up a new project or having a new dream or working in a cross-functional way, those sort of questions still sort of fit in what you're doing. So it's not really a lot of difference when we're designing education spaces. Our project team were 
put together um, the consortium won that in November 2016. Um, a really great group of people um, came together and I guess for us, if you look at the kinds of names that are up on that list, it's a truly cross-government business um, enterprise working together for the good of the state. And for many reasons, the team that were appointed came together in a really quick, I guess, collaborative way pretty early in the piece. And I was thinking about that when Fiona and Gemma were talking earlier, if you were in that session. Fiona said a couple of things that did resonate with me. Um, and we talked about a lot of this stuff in that session. I'll, I'll go through that in a moment. But we were able to move from the culture of collaboration to critical collaboration really quickly. And I never quite worked out or understood how did that actually happen. And I think because our behaviours were already set in terms of we had alignment around our behaviours, so that allowed us to work in that way. So we had a common purpose. We're all really excited. We had engineers, we had architects, we had town, uh, transport planners, all sorts of people on our team. The leadership was effective and there was obviously engagement. And I've got that bus there because what we found in our process of going through this with our private enterprise and cross-government, DIPT, were heavily involved in the process and still are, was we were all on the bus, and you know the story, we we're all going the same direction, but we didn't have our set seats. Depending on what we were doing and what we needed was the driver, the leader of that time. The leader changed, egos were left out the room and it didn't matter who was driving the bus because it was for the common purpose of the project. So for example, for a long time the educators were driving the bus. Susan and her team and obviously myself and educators out in the field because we had to get the education vision right for them to even go and design anything. So they were amazing listeners. Their task then was to really listen. So when we had these debates and conversation, it was really important the engineers were there because they could say to us, well, you can't really have a stage up on the gym floor because it's going to mean this and the kids are going to go through the sit floor. Okay, okay, how do we redesign that? So I had to listen to that conversation, understand the pedagogy and where we were going. We were enthusiastic and the, there was a diverse team and really willing to make a challenge. And you know these little things in a team that you know you're successful? No one was ever late. I could count on one hand the number of meetings we had weekly and still have. Very rare was someone late. Very rare were they absent. They were there and they were on time and working together. We had cultural workshops because we had to really work closely with DIPT in a different way to deliver this. It was a high profile project um, that had a lot of waiting on it in terms of the state and how we worked. So we did run cultural workshops to get that alignment as well. So we, we paid attention to that stuff. And I guess the free flow thinking happened. I'll just share this bit. We've already spoken about it. And as Matt and, and other presenters had too, we really challenged each other because we trusted and had the respect. It was okay then to challenge and I think Matt really talked about being uncomfortable in a collaborative way and you don't, you're not really truly critically collaborative until you are like that. So we worked together, we asked questions, we actually stretched our dream because it was okay. It was okay to be challenged, it was okay not to agree and to debate. So we're out of our comfort zone and that is where the fun really started. Um, the project team would put us in the middle because we we've been there and we still are going on this journey. But it wasn't just about us. We had to really engage with other stakeholders to get, get the design, get the vision and the design where we needed it to be. So DECD um, had support of three principals, really, really fabulous principals out in the field who came in and they were our, I guess, guide on the side. So if we had ideas and images uh, and they sort of guided that design in the early phase. We then, through Cesar's team, where she then started joining the journey, got together herself, her team, and a bunch of amazing educators teaching um, to then really rely on their conversations. So they had, had the architects, everybody in the room, really listening to them for about two or three months about the vision of education for the state. Then we looked at, obviously during that time, we looked at best practice sites, both within South Australia, out of South Australia and internationally. We had a student reference group, so the bunch of principals up in that top circle, we grabbed their kids to talk to them because we didn't have, we had to develop a virtual community and we needed kid feedback. So we had year eights and not, uh, twelves from those three schools really helping us in terms of that. And Cez was actually at that session, it was a real ha ha moment. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting things that they, because it's a vertical school in the city, no fences, no car parking. Is it safe? They wanted to know. How do we know it's safe? 
So we had to work through, talk them through that sort of stuff, changed a couple of things. Yeah. The other thing we had was we had originally a, the cafe of the school at the front as you walked into the entrance. We flipped it to the back because the year eights were going, oh, we wouldn't like that. Can we come into something that's a little bit calmer and gentler and move to the back where it becomes that noisier place and space? So it was really useful listening to those kids' voices. Oh, Miss Swum, our wonderful stakeholders. We use the, both universities have looked at the design and critiqued some of that for us along the way. We've um, already engaged in partnerships with UniSA and um, Adelaide Uni to start working with them, not just around um, education in terms of um, teacher practice being shared and kids being shared. We're actually working now with the um, project management course that's been offered at UniSA on this project. So they've got a live project that they're working on and looking at as we go through. The key education drivers are, are no different to what we've heard today. Um, that interdisciplinary approach, and I guess our team, our project team, was an interdisciplinary uh, approach to this, and we, we role modelled that. Um, contemporary learning environments, we talked about STEM already, but being a school for all, um, and also, I guess, the leadership and being well connected to the, the area that it's in. Um, so then these, are, the pedagogy and vision really drove the design um, around kids being innovative and creative learners. So how do you provide that atmosphere? How do you provide the space and place? We always have a belief that our environment's our third teacher. So how do we ensure that happens? It's a five-star green star school, so you will see kids be able to look at the, our data around the school to see how their building's actually working in an environmental way. Um, really rich experiences. And this school, for us, wasn't just about the, the school that it's in. It actually broadened right out to the community. We don't just see it as the, the school on Frome Street. Um, and the community of learners, that's more around providing back to the community. We want to be able to not just be taken from the big community, but be seen as receivers um, and supporters through that process. This is just another, I guess, slide that demonstrates our neighbours and the connections that we've been able to have um, with, with our neighbours. It's been absolutely fabulous. And I've, people may or may not have seen this, but I'll just share the fly through of our school now. So that's the fly through of our school. Um, I'm just going to finish off with a couple of things. And says we'll come up and talk to you about what does it mean for the kids in this space and place? What does it mean for their learning? And she'll reflect on, on that side of the process. But just a couple of things um, for the project. Um, it was really important that the building's reflected as one building. We've got uh, each talk, uh, side of the building, the north and south, can actually talk to each other. There's linkways going across. So if you're a, a student with a mobility issue, then you're able to easily get around that school. There's obviously three lifts in there as well, but you can actually get across and, and be part of that whole community as well. The acoustics was a challenge. Our acoustic engineers were amazing because I have this, you know, 
the governance around this was pretty fabulous and it kept us safe along the way. And again, Fiona and Gemma talked about those that sort of stuff. But I have this in the back of my mind. Deb, this looks fabulous. They're telling me, but just don't tell me. Tell me it doesn't work. It can't work, not acoustically, because kids have to hear in that space. So we really had to concentrate on what does that mean. So there's a whole lot of things behind that um, that challenged us in the design, but also made it really exciting. Um, so you know, like all projects, opportunities and challenges. It's managing a high-profile project in a unique and exciting um, setting, which became, a, a, you know, turned into a great opportunity. Um, making the most of the location, our um, design team responding to education brief, really extending that beyond our wildest dreams. Um, the design, our premier spoke about agile and adaptable workforce. Well, so our, our buildings need to be like that to create for change moving forward. We know what education looks like up in the past and a little bit into the future, but we really don't know what it's going to look like in five, ten years' time. So our building needs to be adaptable and our kids need to be adaptable for that. And designing a school without a school community um, resulted in creation of that virtual school community, which I think became a real opportunity because we could really think about things differently. We didn't have any preconceived ideas, I guess. Um, transforming the Reed building to what it is was, uh, was a challenge. Achieving the first vertical high school in the state um, and also if I can go just to the second to last dot point, which is another whole story, is we actually had an early contractor involvement where we had two builders with us for about nine months until one actually won the contract outright. So that was quite a different procurement process as well. So I'll leave you with that and I will now hand over to, to Cez who will take us through the table talk task and then we'll move on to conversation about the kids learning. Thanks, Deb. Um, we really want to encourage opportunities for you to ask questions, to talk together and to clarify things. So before I sort of move on to a real focus on the learning journey, let's take some time at your tables or to move with other groups just to talk together about what you heard, brain dump and if there's any questions. So we'll go for about five minutes. Thank you. She's been really interesting walking around um, to the different tables. I'm just going to ask that you pull your conversation to an end, which I think you did beautifully when I started talking. Just going to move around with the microphone just to hear some of the points that were made at the tables. Everyone's pointing and looking. <laughs> I have to follow suit. Um, so can everyone hear me? Mike, um, I guess I've got a question about, it's sort of like an infrastructure yeah. type question. Um, so because there's no car parking kind of thing, uh, is the intention for students to walk or sort of bike in um, or, or catch or public transport? Absolutely. Um, or sort of get dropped off by parents? Because I, I noticed there was no, it didn't look like there was sort of anywhere mm. for a drop off pick up zone and from roads already pretty narrow and great questions and I think we can both answer that I got it meant <laughs> um, and part of the the two focus areas particularly of the school are health sciences as well as STEM as well as a general curriculum so the opportunity to educate the students to use public transport healthy lifestyle sort of walk run etc where they can cycle in is a real priority. You highlight such an important point about safety and the location right smack bang in the middle of the CBD, looking flexibly maybe at opening hours, which means maybe night time, maybe there'll be some courses run then. So what are the implications? So I'm gonna hand over to Deb, who's really been leading this work. Hmm. Um, I guess, it didn't go through the design completely, but um, there is 200 bike parking for students on site down in the basement and about, that's about 170, about 30 around the perimeter of the school as well. So the encouragement is active transport. We're just embarking on a project with um, Dipti, the active um, tr um, travel area in Dipti, to look at a project with both Adelaide High and the New City CBD School to work with um, communities of the feeder primary schools. Because we need to find out the fear of the parents, mainly, why, what, what is it, what are the barriers, and then work through with that. The upgrade to Frome Road is our challenge. Mm. There's People would know that there's looking at an upgrade to Frome Road at the moment and the bike lanes and what does that mean. So we're actually part of that journey as well. So we've got a real opportunity to think about Frome Road differently with that. Um, and we have got two 
kiss and drop areas designated working with Adelaide City Council on that. Um, hoping we don't have to use them as much as other schools because of the public transport realm. Um, this particular school is really lucky because it really, for most families, it does only mean one bus, one tram, one train. You don't really have to get a connector or anything like that. So we really have to go out and see. The other interesting thing for uh, this school and also Adelaide High, it's actually a shared zone. So we'll be working in partnership with Adelaide High School on the processes. So we've, yeah, we've given it a lot of thought. Um, and all of the vertical schools around Australia are built without the car parking. So we have opportunity to do cross-state um, stuff too. We talk about how we're managing that. It's a primary school in Melbourne without car parking. Mm. So we will learn yeah. from what's happening um, around and also that opportunity for deep collaboration with families, with students, as well as our local But you can council. see how the intergovernment and, yeah. and the council and community have to work together on projects. Like if we did this on our own, we would be making, not saying we not, won't make errors because you learn from them, but we'd be making a whole lot more. Mm. You know, you have to be having those doors wide open for conversation mm. and eyes wide open. And we have to be brave. It's a brave new world and you have to make some difference in what you do and how you make those decisions. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to come over to this table. Who would like? <laughs> I love the way everyone points. <laughs> um, so our conversation was more about... Um, so my name's Karen and I work with primary industries and regions um, and I was talking about the work we've been doing recently with the Department of Education and also um, with the University of South Australia around how our industries, uh, our agribusiness industries can get involved in um, working with pre-service teachers to co-design curriculum units of work um, to then show the practical application of how STEM works in reality within industry. And this has come out of our Women Influencing Agribusiness and Regions initiative where we profile the amazing array of roles that women can have within the agribusiness sector. So it's something we've been working on for a few years now and I'm just thinking about what the possibility might be around us being a part of that to do the pre-work for the future yeah, of this school. So that's, that was, yeah, that's the conversation. That's really exciting. And I'll push it as, from a secondary learner perspective, that is really exciting for Botanic and for every school. You know, that opportunity to connect with industry, with pre-service teachers, means you're going in as a teacher with that really authentic understanding around where I think your students are, are heading and we'll talk about that. That's exciting. Thank you. Okay, who? Would anyone like to? Thank you. <laughs> it's all on. I yes. think uh, I think our main question was sort of answered earlier. One of the things we talked about was just, um, I guess, the possibility of encouraging um, students to um, to walk and cycle yeah. and catch public transport to school. Um, I'm an urban planner, and I um, have a strong focus on um, planning for healthy health and well-being and right. getting those um, active travel behaviours sort of early when you're still a student, and then hopefully something you carry through to life is something that we think has been really could be really yeah. exciting. Absolutely. I'm really excited to see the impact on families. So embedding health sciences and healthy lifestyle within, um, within our young people, imagine that opportunity for collaboration and learning from families and seeing what that impact is. And also with the design, and I know we don't have enough time to go through it all, but um, the students will be accessing one of the Adelaide University ovals, which is a little bit of a walk away. And I know in the very early days, I had my high boots on in the range, you remember? <laughs> and we ran and tried to time ourselves and work out how many kilometres. And if it was viable for students with, their, with the staff to actually use that as part of the physical education. And it's quite exciting looking at things a little bit differently. Um, okay, we've got the Heathfield table. Would anyone like to? Oh, thank you. Hi. Um, you may not be able to answer this question, but with the introduction of two other new schools being built, like has the research and the innovation to do with the, the Botanic High School had any impact on the structure of those two new schools? 
Oh, great question. I can probably respond a bit. The yeah. two new schools you're referring to just got announced in the last Thank budget, you. North and South. Um, they're just in early days. So the work we've done with Martin West, Martin Westwell was on this journey with us um, through the design process, really looking at educator spaces and where they fit in, in all of this. The learnings we've got from Botanic High will certainly help us with the future designs. They're not even designed yet. So we've got a lot of learning from here that will really support that, especially, and says we'll talk more about it. We talked a little bit about interdisciplinary learning, but what does that really mean? So, for example, in this particular school, you won't see a science floor, an art floor. You'll see science connected to art, connected with media, connected to design technology. So we'll show you some of that in a moment. So all of that thinking and that research that we've done involving that stuff will help, certainly help us guide mm. the north and south. The partnerships around business and communities and um, the universities will also be part of that journey too. Thank you, everyone. We'll move on to the next little bit. I'll give you that one. <laughs> Okay, we have learnt a lot about learning in recent years um, and we have some fairly compelling data around how students learn but also when we look at where our students are heading and thinking about your comments earlier, 75% of our fastest growing industries require young people with the skills and the capabilities around science, technology, engineering, mathematics, ICT. So we've got to be able to equip our young people with those skills and capabilities to help them thrive, not just within school, but beyond school. We have data which demonstrates that by as early as seven years old, students have decided what career, what pathway they are comfortable pursuing, and that's quite scary, and with that, we connect that with our data of students pursuing STEM-related year 10, 11, 12 pathways into university, and we really need to build that strategically. We really need to work on disposition around science and mathematics and really support our teaching force in partnership with our universities to really build positively that attitude to learning and these areas really, really um, strategically. So, thinking about some of the things that Deb highlighted around Botanic, it is an absolute commitment to integrated learning. So, looking at that opportunity for formal learning spaces where there is that opportunity for explicit teaching, but also informal collaborative spaces that are agile, that they can move and respond to basically the need of students. The beauty of the design is that it is learning within the building but also outdoor spaces. So being able to move not just from a formal environment to a specialised learning space to an informal collaborative learning environment, but also moving outside and beyond. We've got the botanic gardens, we've got the zoo, we've got the University of Adelaide, UniSA, the opportunity to use the precinct around to really develop learning partnerships that, that drive engagement and really do drive those skills and capabilities I, I spoke about a moment ago. The other opportunity for empowering our learners to have a voice in learning more than they've ever had before is really, really clear. So really, I guess the second point I want to make is that unlike the traditional way of looking at learning, and we've, we've had a lot of growth across the state and nation in recent years, but where originally we saw the, the educator or the teacher as the crafter of the learning experience, we're now seeing that totally flipped to empowering learners to think about how they learn best and engage in learning in a really dynamic um, and exciting way. So they're collaborating with others, they're investigating, they're researching, they're developing entrepreneurial skills to drive their journey. They're making connections with industry and business and solving real world problems that help not only engage them in their learning, but contribute to hopefully solutions for the future. 
Um, we also, when we look at um, students entering pathways to university in the STEM related fields, we see an underrepresentation of our Aboriginal learners, of our girls and of our students from low SES. So part of the DECD STEM learning strategy is to really, really drive and focus on building and empowering those cohorts. Um, and part of, I think, and I know it's still in development, but part of the um, the botanic um, high, the opportunity to have an enrolment that really does enable and encourage that cohort to enrol is something that's been talked about. Oh, Deb, did you want to comment on... Oh, just very quickly, um, in terms of this slide, just so when the design team was were looking really closely at what does it mean educationally, we always went back to this. If we had a light bulb moment or a thought mm. because the teaching and learning needs to drive everything we do and these were our general principles around that then what did that actually mean for the built form so how did that look how did that feel what did it, what was the vision of it and then we then took a next step what does it mean for our precinct and community and then on a national and global level as well so every time we kind of had a thought an idea needed to redirect and come back this slide was the one that kept us safe was probably more that I wanted mm. to share that yeah, thank you. So we saw the beautiful image of the school and you can see there, it's, um, that you can just make it. So beautiful profile, but the idea from, even from the Frome Road um, presentation is that there are interesting seats, dynamic little nooks and crannies that really encourage sitting and talking and collaboration. Deb's talked about collaboration through the design concept right through to the reality where we are now, the building stage. When uh, really you can parallel that journey with what we want to see in regard to the learning. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time looking at some of the spaces, talking about the learning and I really want to encourage you if you've got any questions, just raise your hand. I'd love to keep this as really in integrated as possible. So this is the entrance, it's absolutely gorgeous. So you'll see as you move through the entrance from Frome Road, the most amazing wooden which looks like a staircase. It's actually places to socialise, places to meet, both for educators as well as for um, our, young, our young students. So it's very much public, alive, exciting. To the left, Deb mentioned the um, library, and you'll see a blurring of edges. So you've got main entrance, places to sit, to talk, to collaborate, to work. In fact, almost every area in the little pods that go out from there are writable. So you can be brainstorming on writable surfaces. Um, the, on the left hand side is the library and the lines and the boundaries are blurred with the library as well. So there you can enter the library, you can move to the back and have a private space, but there are tables, there are chairs for collaboration, for discussion, um, for engaging in learning that also connect opposite to the cafe. So we see the blurring of the cafe with the library and also to the outside area. Um, it's quite um, interesting to see when you look at the image, there is a lot of glass and a real commitment to feeling and seeing learning in action so that you might be sitting in, in plaza area and look up and you can actually see kids in learning pods engaging in learning. So you're immersed physically in this concept of collaboration. Um, you know, and the opportunity to, Deb mentioned about the CBD location and being able to give back to the community with the, the gymnasium and, and opportunities within the performing arts. But it is an opportunity to um, hire out, particularly this particular area where there's one space which is like a little mini lecture theatre where um, we can have guest speakers, people from industry working with young people, be a great spot for the kids before they go out into the city to touch down and debrief. And from the outside, the public are watching this learning. Okay, this is um, 
from the, I don't know if you noticed on the, the fly through, the actual front build is is raised up 1.5 metres. So there's no traditional fence around this school like there is in many schools, but that raising up of that front building creates a really natural um, separation from the footpath, but it also creates opportunities and it's been really cleverly designed that there are now sort of, with the elevated spaces, places for kids to sit outside and to, to work. So it's made it a really, really physically attractive but practical integrated space. So there are little seating nooks and, and extended edges that you can sit on and continue that working. Um, you know, the connection, you can see it a little better here, the connection with the library to the outside and then the library to the cafe, cafe to outside. It's really zoning learning and allowing that to be agile and flexible based on the individual student's need. Um, I mentioned the plaza space. Um, as well, which you can see there just to the side. It's, um, it really encourages movement. So we talked about health sciences and, and kids being really, really healthy and fit. We really want to see the kids moving through botanic, through the vertical rooms physically and that centrepiece really does enable um, that movement, that flow through of movement. Underneath, so underneath that main centrepiece stairway is the most amazing, it's almost a showpiece, it's a design centre. So that's where we can see electronics, robotics, so every aspect of the design has been utilised. Um, and the gallery space really connects visually to the street. And I mentioned that everything is about learning, learning um, happening everywhere, but it being really, really visible. So walking along Frome Road, you can actually see the gallery space. So you can see kids learning, kids engaging in learning in a dynamic way. Um, and also, as I mentioned, it can be the touchdown, the, the spot they go to before they head out into the city. Um, the other thing, and I was chatting to one of the tables earlier, the beautiful thing is that learning doesn't have to be grounded in a place like a school. What it can be is one of many learning opportunities within a gigantic landscape. So for Botanic, maximising the fact that we're surrounded by Botanic, UniSA, etc., but also beyond that, the city, so that we're seeing learning happening in the most agile way. Challenge for the school is that to enable that agility, so we see in many schools excursions, incursions happening, the challenge for the school and for us to learn from is that kids are going to be able to go out, learn in different environments, go over to the university, etc., but also be able to parallel those learning experiences back within the dynamic of Botanic High School. So looking at the structure, really clear focus on the public things happening at the base, moving up to more private. So the gymnasium is down the bottom, is public, is noisy and it's alive, as well as the cafe, the library. And as we move through, um, we go more to the senior school, um, specialised areas, all of them maintaining a really clear, although different personalities on every level, a really clear commitment to explicit teaching, opportunities for collaboration, opportunities for deep thinking and moving through um, in, a, in an agile way that will really, really support the learning needs of every individual learner. You can see just at the top, and you may have noticed it on the fly-through, fly when you get sort of past that centrepiece, that, that beautiful staircase, there are bridges that link the two buildings a lot of glass. Um, I just remember some really rich conversations, particularly around performing arts, which is my little baby, um, around how how open should it be? I mean, if you've got kids learning and practicing, how amazing is it that kids could be walking up the stairs and looking over and watching classes? And that was the commitment, that it is open learning everywhere. With that, with that real commitment to ensuring that um, 
the dynamics and the sound were appropriate, it is alive and really, really agile. If I could just step in there yeah. just briefly. Um, the slide before, you have to imagine that you saw blobs on the... Um, they're actually a lot of glass, big glass sliding walls. Mm. So when the kids need to have that quieter time, but still visually you can see as an educator for another space, having that passive supervision and so on, you can see but not hear. But when you need to open, you can. So it's not a barn, but it can be a barn if you want to. So all the spaces connect in one way or another, but they don't have to connect, depending on what we're teaching. So it's agile. It's in the moment. You can open and close them really easily in a, in a split second, depending on what's happening in your space and place. So, um, so that ability for educators to support each other in a passive way is still there, but you can close it up. So you don't necessarily have to hear what's happening. Mm. Do you know, I'm, I mentioned earlier about um, some of the data and about re really building in our young people the love of, of um, science and technology and really supporting them for life beyond school. Um, we've really got to do something different as an education system and this project, this opportunity to work collaboratively to go really deeply into learning has been amazing. Um, but what we know, and we look at um, through, and I'm not sure how many people would be familiar with the FLOW program, which is flexible learning options, we see a lot of students that have disengaged from learning. So the opportunity to flip the way our young people learn, to centre on the learning needs and that opportunity to build in them those skills that will take them beyond life is really, really exciting. So this is a, um, a slice, if you like, of level four. Um, it's a really great example of interdisciplinary learning um, where you can see in, um, and, and I really want to re-emphasize that we've got the formula there with collaborative spaces and specialized spaces, but no floor is the same. But the concept is, two specialist areas together. So you can see there in orange, two sciences, etc., arts. So that opportunity for cohorts, groups to work together in specialist areas. We can see in the blue collaborative learning environments are all visually and physically accessible to every one of those learning areas um, to enable that opportunity for breakout, for stretching and also for interdisciplinary learning. Um, you can also see in the purple the flexible learning spaces. So opportunities, not timetabled, but opportunities to really, really build dynamic collaborative learning opportunities um, in a range of areas. Um, and after much discussion within the team, with, with everyone, DECD, educators, experts, the ideal model was two specialised areas alongside each other. Um, rather than having, like we've seen in a lot of other areas, say for example, four, four of the science classes together. But what it does from an operational point of view is that you could almost have an entire floor as a learning community. And one of the things that Alastair Brown as principal will bring to the school is this to life. So what does this look like? If we think of the design, the pedagogy that underpins and the rationale, there is a whole nother layer, which is how do you bring it to life as a principal? How do we timetable something like this? How do I set up cohorts or communities to really maximize the potential of this? Jump in any time, Deb. Um, okay, so this is um, this plan just shows that um, I think it really re-emphasizes that physical as well as the visual connection to the learning commons. So we see here the um, art media directly coming out of the learning, um, connecting onto that learning common. The learning pod at the base, that's open and connected to the common area. So that's perfect for little breakout groups that need to work sort of together, not timetabled, but they can actually do some really deep collaboration there. It also 
has is totally glass. So if you're sitting on that beautiful staircase that, that we looked at at the beginning, you can actually look up and see the kids in the learning pod engaging in collaborative learning. The think tank is really important. Um, it's a it's a timetabled space, acoustically um, discreet, so you can shut it off for groups of educators or teachers to work together. I feel really passionate about this. In education, we have a lot of a percentage of our young people, I think it's around about 8%, who um, because of the way, um, whether it be auditory processing, they really need quiet spaces, so that opportunity to work really strategically in think tanks with students that need that quieter, calmer environment is there as well. Um, I get excited talking about this. Um, the, um, yeah, and the acoustics is something that oh, we had such a lot of, of um, discussion around this because you need to create an environment that is agile, that is flexible based on the learning need and, and what, what you're working on with your team of students. But you need to be able to have quiet time, explicit teaching, opportunities for that deep learning as well. So these are just examples of some of the spaces from, um, from Botanic School and you can see that everywhere there's a commitment to, to grouping, to being able to um, plan, decide, design, write on the whiteboard spaces but there are a range of sizes for breakouts and really, really dynamic spaces that um, that students, educators as well, can, can select and work on. This is really exciting coming from a teacher perspective as well. The educator spaces are nestled within the learning environment, close to the learning commons. Kids can see educators working, but there's a degree of privacy, but there's also it's very open. So the protocols, and I talked about some of the challenges as a principal in bringing to life this design, it is working really closely with educators to be able to get used to that environment. But, but I love the fact that educators are learning and working within the same environment as our students are engaging in learning too. I really love this picture and um, even though it's a little bit out of focus, a little bit blurry, learning is a social venture and we need to remember this and keep this I think at the forefront of our, our uh, minds. We've talked about the school, actually I'm looking at the time too, I'm going to have to talk a bit faster. Um, there are so many spaces internally, externally for students to engage in learning in a social collaborative way to meet together that we were talking on one of the tables about the botanic gardens. How amazing you could have particular species of plants growing in one of the outdoor areas that you've collaborated with your team of, of students um, to grow and then you could be looking with a science lens at how that connects to um, science that they're studying. Just so many amazing ways of connecting the outdoor, the local precinct, but to work in the most social way. Really interesting study by the University of Queensland which showed a significant increase in engagement of students and also in their depth of learning through the, position, through the provision of spaces that enabled that social interaction. So they, the spaces that nurtured ideation and creation that integrated flexible technology, and I should have talked about that earlier, I'll add that in a moment, but that fosters communication, collaboration, exactly what we're talking about here today. But, and I used to say this to my students, learning should be fun, it should be fun, and we should be dying to do it for the rest of our lives. That opportunity to tinker, to explore, to experiment, Technology is moving at such an incredibly fast rate. So with that, we've got the opportunity with Botanic to enable that agility for our learners and really utilise the potential of technology. Just another image, um, really just demonstrating what the aim is and, and the design reflecting 
the opportunity for innovative pedagogies, moving away from the teacher standing at the front, but getting in there and learning in partnership with the students. There is one space within Botanic that's fitted to provide absolute darkness, so that opportunity for investigating light, for working with sensors and holographics is really rich and exciting. And um, there the integration of media arts, for example, um, exploring and creating images, both real, imagined, abstract, through media arts technology and holographics is there. Another, um, I'm quite excited about this as well, I, it's a decentral, it's a science learning laboratories are um, scattered throughout the school design. Um, and the, the, for those of you, probably many of you can only recently remember being at school, where the science lab assistant would put together all of the experiments and do a range of things. So Botanic, it is absolutely visual to the students. So there's an opportunity not just for undertaking um, vet lab, lab um, laboratory studies, but the opportunity for students to watch people preparing experiments and actually learn as, as educators work within that really specialist environment. Um, um, that, and also that connection to the real world, so pathway. So once you start stretching pedagogy to be dynamic and student focused, that connection with business and industry, universities becomes richer and more exciting. Um, so having those opportunities to really create those individual pathways and moving students fluidly outside into the world of work whilst learning is there. Ten minutes. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to move through these. These are some more examples of the spaces within CBD school and similar images. Um, really, sort of science really does give that context for linking the technology, the engineering, and maths to real world problems. So that opportunity to really build with our, our think tanks and um, opportunities for discussion and collaborating and designing for the students. I just want to reinforce that learning is both within the building and outside. So locally in collaborative spaces, so Wi-Fi will enable the students to be really agile with the technology, but also agile into the CBD and beyond in their learning. So, perfect timing in that we've got just a couple of minutes. We thought it would be really good for you just to have a few minutes to talk at your tables about what you've heard with the lens of entrepreneurial mindset and it really has been the through line for your thinking and your working today. The opportunity, we may not get time to think, pair, share, but have a read of the quote and have a chat just for a minute and then we'll pull. If there's any burning questions, we can yeah. respond before yeah. we go on already. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. 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 Not so much in the design, but yeah. yeah, it's a really good question around, I, I mentioned about Aboriginal learners, our girls, low SES, um, low status economic communities underrepresented in STEM pathways. Um, so, to, so physically the connection to learning is around all learners, but when I spoke about that I was referring to the opportunity to have a special entry at year eight for 20 students from regional isolated um, areas. And that was, I think, still in the design and discussion stage. Yes. Um, but that opportunity for students, um, you know, in some remote areas like Cooper PD, who may want to engage in learning within that environment. But further to that, um, through the DCD STEM learning strategy, and we've sort of been working really closely with this school, but stretching, got some really targeted um, 
elements of that strategy that really do focus on really supporting that pathway development. Yvette Suave, for example, is leading a STEM scholarships um, um, element or project where we're actually supporting our young learners within those areas, whether it be through um, support for technology to really encourage them to engage in STEM pathways, partnering with professional learning, inspirational speakers from industry, from university, as well as a number of other um, strategies within that. Mm. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. That makes it a bit easier. Um, you Can everyone hear me? Oh. Um, you said you wanted to focus more on STEM, and I was wondering why not STEAM, so including the arts? And you know, if I could get started, and I'm going to let Deb answer the official answer, I um, think it's contemporary learning generally. So yeah. when we think of learning, it is learning, learning. Science, technology, engineering and maths and looking at the um, future need of our economy, looking at the capabilities that are going to support our young people in life regardless. So, STEAM. Yeah. so the arts is really, I mean really if you looked at the design of the school we had more time to go into the detail. It really is STEAM or STEM plus everything else. Yeah. So you'll see beautiful performing arts spaces, you'll see music practice rooms, you'll see digital media connecting with art, with science. So it is all there. It is a school for all. Um, you'll also see a kitchen, uh, a VET3, a CERT3 um, VET kitchen as well. So kids can actually get to their CERT3 at this school. So STEM was the announcement. It's a vision for the nation. It's a vision for the state. It's a vision for our universities. But we are a school for all and the focus on arts was incredibly strong through the process. And you'll, you'll see that. And um, we were very lucky about a month or so ago to have our principal appointed 18 months, or just over 18 months ahead of time. And um, that particular principal, Alistair, has been involved in some of the design stuff as one of our principal reference people. Um, but like um, says said, he's got a great, great opportunity ahead of him to really marry all this together. Mm. And he's, he's very much uh, arts focused as well. So yeah. yeah, I think be ready to watch the space. I think it'd be great. The other thing we haven't touched on very quickly is we want it to be a school for our state as well. Yeah. So with the IT opportunities to connect with our YALA, our Mount Gambia, our border region is really exciting. We started conversations with the zoo because um, during the Christmas holiday period there's zoo's new area is not used. So could that could be an area for our country kids to come down, stay and have access to the school during, you know, term time breaks and things like that. So it's a vision goes all to go beyond just the cohort of kids that actually attend our school. Thank you. Thing, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> we, we do have 20 minutes for break, so I would urge you to um, chase down Saz and Deb if you have other questions that we didn't get time to. I mean, the thing that's really... Um, I think the thing that's really exciting is that the spaces that we're talking about here for Botanic are, are spaces that are flexible and that will be able to be used in different ways over the over the life of the school. Um, and I think, you know, while we've been talking about school and learning in this session, those things can easily be applied to the way that we think about our workspaces and how we learn in workspaces. So about a month ago, I was in Dubai for um, a foresight uh, workshop that I was leading. I had the opportunity to go and see the Knowledge and Human Development Agency. Um, I walked into that space. There was a giant chessboard. There were budgery guards flying around the space. Each meeting room was themed like a jungle or a cloud or one had three exercise bikes in it. Um, I went upstairs and the offices were positioned around a running track for walking meetings. Um, there was a, a gym at the front window that you could use at about four o'clock. Everything was open. There were lots of plants. Um, it was just the most amazing space I had ever seen and this was for a regulatory agency. And I think if we can sort of look at anything about what we're doing with our young people now and saying these are the type of learning spaces you need because these are the types of skills that you're going to need to be able to access in order to work well in the future. We also need to be thinking about how we are translating that into our own innovation entrepreneurial workspaces. So it's clear that from, from this that you know, I loved it when you said learning should be fun. You know, we should want to do it forever. Um, if we think about our own entrepreneurship journeys, we should want, that's what we should want to be doing. How do we change this? How do we challenge it? How do we move it forward? 
Then I think the provocation is how do we think about the spaces that we're working in? So if you're in the previous session where we were looking at um, the experience of the Charles Sturt Council area community, you know, all of that in innovation work was being done in the community in outdoor spaces. So how are, we, how are we thinking about using our spaces more creatively and, and differently? How do we make sure that we put something in differently when we have the opportunity? And how do we think about how to, how to use the spaces that we're using in order to shape the sort of entrepreneurial culture we want to see? I think all of that is a, a really great provocation. Um, and certainly being able to see that to life in a school and understand then what that those school graduates will be expecting of a culture and a space from, from us, I think is, is, is a good provocation to, to make some changes. So um, please join me in thanking Sez and Deb. Thank you. We have afternoon tea um, served out there and then we're back in the main room for our final session, which is a keynote session and that will start at 2.45 p.m.